Pete Murray, welcome to Australian Musician. Nice to talk to you. Uh, we're chatting today because you've got a, a new EP coming out on March 5 called The Night. Um, there's no track called The Night. Uh, why did you decide to call the EP The Night? Well, if you um, listen to Way For This Love, there's a lyric in there. The night before I go. So I, I, I'm giving away too much here, Greg, but uh, just for you, I'll do it for you. So the um, that song I thought was a, a beautiful song that really represented the um, this body of work. And um, so what we're doing at the moment is that there's an EP, EP1 we're calling it, which is called The Night. Because it was when I recorded the the, uh, the body of work, there's, there's easily an album's worth of material there. But we just wanted to do a, an EP this time around just because it's, um, I guess it's a lot easier for people to um, to get into, you know, rather than an album these days. I think the attention span is not really there for a whole album. So we um, we decided to do an EP. And um, when I say we, I talk with, you know, with my management as well. We had big discussions about what do we do. Uh, so, you know, coming up for a title was really an interesting thing because I wanted to, we're doing EP one, then uh, we're looking at doing EP two very soon. And I wanted to tie this in with, with the one title, but how do we do that? So basically um, I've picked a line, uh, a lyric line in, in that song that will basically flow over the two EPs. And then later I would like to, to possibly if it works, just to, to put that out as a, as an album, even if it's just on digital, so people can, um, or vinyl, so people can have the, um, what the body of work was, you know, was at the time when I re recorded it. Yeah, I, I suppose in the digital age, it's uh, hard to know what constitutes an album and, and what's an EP, how many, how many tracks, um, maybe the terminology needs to change. I think it's time, isn't it? There's uh, um, so many minutes of, uh, which will, constitute an album or an EP. I can't remember what that is, but there is a certain time for an album. Um, and I think the six tracks came close to that. It wasn't quite enough. So yeah. uh, anyway, we, we weren't interested in doing an album at the time. And it's just really, um, it's it's just changed so much, the, you know, this day and age too, where the old school days, when you have the album there, you'd have you, you know, three or four singles, if you're lucky to have that out there. But, um, you know, people would, would buy the album, so they would listen to it. Um, these days there's, there's no real need to listen to an album you can just sort of skip and skip to the next thing so there's so much um, music to be to be um, listened to these days so I think you know having an EP is just a little bit less that people can get in and get from start to finish and hopefully enjoy that yeah uh, you've done some co-writing uh, with this EP uh, the track if we never dance again was co-written with um, Morgan Dorr in LA um, how did you find the experience of co-writing? You know, at first I was really nervous about it. Uh, I haven't done uh, a couple of songs I did before actually um, co-writing with a, a guy called John Hume from Evermore. John's a producer now and lives in LA. I did a couple of songs on the Camacho album, but before that there was nothing. So uh, my experience of co-writing has been pretty limited. Uh, the chance to go over to... Uh, LA and Nashville, which is, uh, you know, you got some great songwriters over there, guys who were very experienced. I was very nervous about it because I wasn't sure whether I would get over there in the room and and not produce the goods. So, you know, that was um, concerning for me. I was very nervous about it for the first few sessions anyway. Um, but I, look, I got in uh, with Morgan in the second session that I did. And, you know, this tune, um, started off sounding really amazing. And I remember we didn't quite finish it. And I remember going back to the hotel room for the next couple of days and listening to this song, even though I was writing, doing other writing sessions as well. But this song had something really um, powerful about it that I wanted to get back in and finish the song off with, with, um, with Morgan. Plus Morgan's also, he, he's um, with the Sony ATV, the publishing company in, in um, LA. And he's quite successful with getting songs on, um, you know, um, movies and TV shows and he's, he's been successful so one of their good writers so when I got the opportunity to write with him I remember management even saying to me listen don't stuff this up this is a great opportunity so yeah no pressure you know but don't don't mess this one up so it was nice you know he, he and Morgan's wrapped in the song he's he's really 
um, loving it too. So it, it was definitely a great experience and something that's, that's given me a little bit more confidence to go and do some more of it. Yeah. And I mean, I'd even love to live in, in America for a little while and actually do some more co-writing for a, for a longer period of time, just for even for other people. Yeah. So how would a song like If We Never Dance Again differ if it was just you writing it? Well, for starters, Morgan had the the music, the first uh, few chords of the chorus and the first line, you know, uh, if you never see my face again, which was an important start. That was really, that's what set up the whole song. From there, um, I was kind of really charging. He was kind of doing a lot more of the music and I was really charging him with the lyrics. But he got the, he got it off to a good start because I think that was a really powerful line. And um, uh, it just really kind of fell into place. So he was great too. I found, you know, when I did the, uh, the, the lead vocal for this, <clears throat> the, um, the verses were recorded in his studio with him. And he was great being, uh, giving me, you know, some advice on how to sing it and, and, and just the um, different inflections and things like that. So I think, uh, you know, I guess, you know, you've got two people in a room, you're going to have two different melodies. And, and um, I guess I found it quite good when, when I was, you know, if I got stuck on any lyrics, he was great to go, hey, about this, try that. So there's someone else there that when you get stumped, <clears throat> they'll have something where you, you hope they've got something that's going to kind of then trigger you to go, oh, that's, I love that, let's, let's do this, you know, and then it flows on. And that's how we had that working relationship with, with Morgan. It was really like, whenever I got stumped, he would have an idea and then we'd move forward and then I'd have an idea. So it was, it was great, you know, and um, in the end, you know, we, I went back and had uh, made a second session with him because I just thought the song had a lot of potential and I wanted to finish it before I came home. Yeah. Uh, who are some other songwriters that you admire for the way they construct their songs? You know, uh, well, I mean, you take you right back to, say, Bob Dylan and Neil Young. I mean, those guys are um, two writers that I've admired for a long time. I just think that, I know Bob Dylan gets a hard time about his voice, but I think it's incredible the way his melodies are amazing. He's, obviously his lyrics are amazing, incredible, but his melodies are fantastic. Um, you know, uh, Neil Young's the same, you know, Anthony Kiedis, I think his lyrics and his melodies are genius. Um, he's not the greatest singer in the world, but he's an incredible um, lyricist and, and his melodies once again for the Chili Peppers. It's insane what that guy does. So I think there's, Anyone that's got that's got a um, uh, credibility and and and, and writes a, a great song that can be commercially accessible is a great songwriter. That's not an easy thing to do to try and hit a um, commercial market and and at the same time keep your integrity and, and your credibility. There are lots of pop songs that are that are very popular. I don't think that they have a lot of credibility and it's, they don't last forever and there's not much depth to them. So for me, you know, lyrics, um, credibility, I think are a really big thing when, you, when you're looking at what, what, I, what I like in songs. Yeah. Um, the Cole Clark Fat Lady 2 has been your main guitar for songwriting and performing yeah. for quite some time. Um, tell me about how you acquired that guitar and what you like about it. Yeah, I was... It was quite a funny story. I was playing another brand, which I won't mention what it was, but I was had that and the guys said, look, you know, um, use our brand and um, <clears throat> we might give you the guitar at the end. It was not really, it was just basically, if you, as long as you're playing it, you can have it. And it was okay. It was, it was quite a nice guitar. Um, but then uh, my guitarist, uh, Pete Williamson, who was in my original band, The Stonemasons, he said, hey, there's these new, new guitars out called Cole Clark. Have you heard about them? I said, no. He said, they're, they're perfect for you. They're really rootsy. Uh, they've got a rich um, tone. It's warm. Um, and, uh, you know, he just, he just has this rootsy vibe, which, what, which is what the, I was playing at the time, you know, and that's, he said, this is, just try it out. So I actually, I, I played it and I played it live and I was like, wow, this is, this is killing the other guitar. It's, it's so much better. And I remember... Uh, we had a morning show um, <clears throat> song we were playing live and I just played this Cole Clark because it was just killing it. And uh, so we just had, yeah, had the guys from the other company going, hey, what's going on? He was, you know, really kind of getting 
pretty peeved about the whole situation. It was like, this is better. This just works, you know. It's um, it's a great, great guitar and um, works really well, you know. So uh, for live guitars, I, I prefer them. They're great. I've had some Maiton guitars as well. And Maiton's also, um, Andy from the custom shop is a brilliant uh, maker at Maiton. And he, uh, he made me a guitar a few years ago, which is unbelievable. It stands up very close to the old vintage sounding guitars that I've got. Not quite the same, but it stands up very close. So acoustically, that thing was incredible. Um, but I don't, I just felt, and I played it live for a while, but I just didn't feel like it had the same, um, the pickups and the sound live just wasn't quite cutting it for a beautiful sound and quite and really super bright, but I kind of like the warmer, rootsier flavor. So nothing wrong about the mate at all. They're beautiful guitars, and I've still got that, and I love it. But for the Cole Clark, it just seems to work for me uh, with that really rooty, warm acoustic vibe. Um, how will you look back at your 2020? 2020 has been an interesting year. You know, I've actually really enjoyed it, to be honest. Um, and I think a lot of people have said the same thing. They've, they've had a lot more time with their family. And I do have a lot of time with my family anyway. But, you know, to have that time where no one was hassling you and we, you know, we had um, a release, uh, Found My Place, the first song off the EP came out. But I was doing Zoom meetings, you know, and I think everyone who started doing Zoom meetings was loving the fact that they could be at home spending more time with their family, duck off, do a quick interview and then come back to the family again. And, and especially being in Byron, Byron's a pretty busy place now. I was able to, you know, go downtown, go to the beach, have a surf. And there was really no one around. It was really like a ghost town. So in a way, everyone that was, that was a local to Byron before the big influx and everyone came after, it was a really nice time because it was, you'd see the old fellows in the street and they would say, this is like, back in the seventies. And it was, you know, with the less people um, surfing, less people on the street, it was a really cool time. So as hard as it was not working, I actually, I enjoyed the, the time just hanging with um, with family and, and, and enjoying and experiencing that, what, what Byron had to offer without all the people around. Yeah. Um, a lot of musicians have been doing it really tough, particularly here in Victoria. Um, you've always been into good health and well-being, and you actually ran a retreat a couple of years ago with Benny Owen what tips would you give to musicians who are looking for ways of getting on top of things emotionally look staying staying fit and healthy is a really big part of that I think when you when you start feeling terrible uh, if, if, um, and unfit um, fat your belly starts hanging out you know you start to feel um, unhappy so for me you know when I feel um, fit and, and strong I just feel better even though it's, you know, it is it's tough not working and, and it's been a really hard thing to, to put everything on hold for 12 months. There's a, my guitar tech is probably um, Michael Luke. He's, he's been a great, a great example of what to do. He was, he was a pretty chubby fella, like Benny Owen, who I was involved with. Um, you know, Benny was a 120 kg or something. He's a big fella. And Lukey, as I call him, Lukey was, was a pretty big fella too. He's, now loving life he's stripped down to like 80 something k's he looks fit lost his belly he's and he started off just doing push-ups um sit-ups and even squats just whatever he could do in the, the hotel room when he'd get back when he got you know 10 15 minutes it wasn't a long i think it was actually eight minutes he worked out for him. he'd do eight minutes a day and that exercise really kind of inspired him to kind of get get better so i think you know eating well is, is uh one major thing and then do eight, 10, 15 minutes, whatever you can do in a day regularly and you'll start to feel better about yourself and, and you know, um, healthier. Yeah. Um, the night, the EP is out March 5. Um, what's on for the rest of 2021 for Pete Murray? Well, hopefully more live shows. Uh, there's, um, well, I played a show on the weekend in Adelaide, which was, you know, fantastic to get back and play with the band again and, and to... Uh, you know, get in front of a good sized crowd because it's been tough. We haven't been able to do that. Um, and I, you know, I, I applaud the government with how they've been handling the whole COVID situation. It's not, it's not easy. And I'm, I honestly, I 
hate to be running this country right now after the fires and uh, you know at the beginning of last year and then COVID it's been pretty massive but um, we definitely hope that, that the government can keep the job keeper going for the musicians at the moment that, that are that don't have any work and then I really hope that they can open things up for us for live and, and really start to get on the same level as what the sporting events are at the moment. The sporting events are getting large numbers um, to, to those events. There's no difference with what we're doing. In Adelaide on the weekend, we had 5,000 people. Um, everyone sat in their chair, everyone you know, followed the rules. People, I think the public want live music back probably even more than what we do. It's a really important thing for everyone. Uh, you know, Music brings a lot of joy to people. And it gives them a, um, a break from what they might be going through that's, that's difficult. And I think, you know, definitely um, it's good for the population and it's good, definitely good for the music industry because we need to get back. We need to be working again. This is how we earn our living. So hopefully this year will be a lot more touring and we can all get back on track and really start playing the shows that we were at, you know, last time we were playing. Yeah. All right, Pete. Well, it's been great to catch up. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Nice to chat to you too.